Thanks, Adam. So uh, as Adam mentioned, um, ZFS is uh, now more than 10 years old. Um, some of the code in it is definitely uh, at least 10 years old. Um, and uh, it was shipped about more than five years ago. So uh, it's getting to be you know, a little bit middle aged. So um, one, one part of libzfs, which is definitely showing its age, is uh, one part of ZFS, which is definitely showing its age, is libzfs, which is the library um, for interfacing with the ZFS uh, for doing administrative stuff. So uh, if you've ever used the ZFS CLI at all, um, you know, ZFS get, ZFS list, creating, deleting stuff, creating a, a pool, that all uses libzfs internally to do, to talk to the kernel and do all of its operations. Um, and also I'll mention that uh, another big uh, important consumer of libzfs is not just the CLI tools, but all the tools that um, all, all of you guys are writing that use libzfs to interface with, with ZFS. So like at Delphix here, um, we use uh, libzfs in, uh, by interfacing to it with our Java stack to do uh, all of our snapshot management, um, getting properties, figuring out what's going on in the system, um, creating and destroying uh, file systems and clones and snapshots and all that. So I imagine that um, other people out there are doing similar things with their products. Um, I know we had a lot of people when, when we were at Sun, different groups that wanted to do things like this and uh, our answer to them was always, don't use libzfs because it's not a supported interface. Use the ZFS CLI. And, uh, pretty much everybody ignored us, <laughs> and they use libzfs anyways because, um, you know, even though it's not supported and it has a lot of flaws, um, you know, there's obviously performance advantages of not having to fork an exec, uh, you know, slash sbin slash zfs, um, and uh, you know, there's just kind of co code cleanliness advantages advantages to being able to use like a C API to get numbers from the kernel that tell you about what's going on um, rather than parsing the supported and parsable output from the, C from the CLI. You know, it's still text that you have to parse up. So <coughs> with that in mind, I want to give a little bit of an overview of the state of libzfs. So it's not thread safe. So there's like some caches in there. Um, there's this global libzfs error. So whenever you make a call that might have an error, um, the error number is actually, it returns, I think it always like returns negative one if it fails and then stashes the error number and some additional error information in this um, well, global um, libzfs error. It's not actually global, but it's specific to the libzfs handle. So um, different uh, consumers have different ways of dealing with this. Uh, the, Z, the AKD and the ZFS appliance, um, I believe wraps the handle with the mutex so that only one thread can be accessing it at a time. Um, in Delphix, we use a pool of libzfs handles so that we can be concurrently uh, doing ZFS operations like getting stats from uh, different threads. Um, it, like I said, it's an unstable interface, but uh, everybody links against it anyways, so everybody's running this risk that um, if, we, if somebody happens to change a libzfs interface as they are well entitled to, then uh, everybody's binaries are going to break. We did. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Does what means? Sorry, what's that? Does everybody understand what unstable means? Um, so un unstable basically means that the interface can change at any time. So developers can just decide, oh, we don't like this. We're gonna like this. This function used to mean one thing, and now it means something else. It takes a different number of arguments or whatever. So if you have a binary uh, that's linked against libzfs, and then you install a new version of libzfs, uh, then your program might work or it might just do something totally wrong. It might crash or it might do the totally wrong thing. Um, destroy all your data. Yeah. <laughs> ZFS create might not mean ZFS destroy. Uh, so what do you think? <laughs> so it, it, uh, instead, we, the supported interface is the, the command line interface. So um, the ZFS command that's documented in the man page. So that's been stable um, si since Slurs 10 update two. Um, and that's been the supported way to uh, do ZFS administration. Um, right. So there's some other weird things about libzfs that are a little bit unusual for a library, uh, like printing error messages to standard error. Um, it's actually, it is possible to turn this off, but um, it does print a lot of useful things there that are hard to get otherwise. So um, 
And the upside no longer calls exit. <laughs> That's true. Uh, <laughs> I think there's a flag. I think that if you say don't print things, then it also doesn't exit. Oh, Jesus. Um, <laughs> so, all right. Um, and there's a lot of uh, kind of deficiencies in uh, the actual interface itself. So, uh, like, the properties is kind of the most glaring, where there's uh, from the CLI, you know, when you get our set properties, it's with this nice, consistent interface. You say ZFS, get the name of the property, and there you have it. You, you'll get the property. You want to set it, ZFS, set, name of the property equals value, then the file system that you want to set it on, done. Um, but with libzfs, there's different uh, functions for manipulating different kinds of properties. So uh, fixed, fixed properties like um, used and quota um, have values in this ZFS prop T uh, enum that specify which property you want to manipulate. Um, other properties, like user properties, um, have different way of, of getting it. User used in user quota and group quota properties have a different way of doing it. Um, the new written at properties uh, that I recently introduced have a different way of getting it. Um, and if you're not familiar with these properties, um, what they are is they allow you to specify uh, uh, something else after this at sign. So like user use, you can say, how much is <coughs> space is being used by this particular user? So I can say, ZFS get user used at M errands, and then it'll tell me how much space uh, my user ID is using on a given file system. And the written at properties let you specify a snapshot uh, that it'll tell you how much space was written since that snapshot. So you can do ZFS get written at, and then the name of the snapshot. <coughs> um, right. So, uh, and then uh, lastly, um, well, not lastly, but one of the other things uh, that's kind of weird about ZFS, this isn't really weird, but it makes it a little bit hard to use in, in some situations, is um, the uh, iteration via recursion. So when we, when you want to like get the list of data sets or list of snapshots that are uh, part of a data set, um, the way that that works is uh, libzfs does an ioctl down to the kernel to get each um, snapshot that's part of that file system and then calls a callback for you. So um, this is, this is uh, on the one hand, very scalable, uh, but it's not very fast because we have to go down to the kernel, do all the checks, open up everything to find what's that one next uh, snapshot that you're looking for. Um, and then from a programming point of view, um, having to write callbacks with, um, you know, with little structs that, to pass the data that you need to each one is uh, sometimes a little bit cumbersome. So um, then I uh, took a look at uh, what's the code look like for libzfs. So it's pretty big. It's not, you know, it's not ridiculous, but 20,000 lines, is, it's not small. Um, there's a lot of uh, things where the knowledge of a given uh, concept is spread out all over the code base. So for example, when adding a new property, you have to go modify at least these four places that I found with the mm -hmm. quick look. Um, and there's some weird kind of boundaries between libzfs and the, um, the CLI tools, uh, zfs and zpool. So uh, like for example, there's some routines in libzfs that seem to be there purely um, to share code between the ZFS and zpool commands, but uh, seem to have very little utility for any any other libzfs consumers. So things that don't really make sense from uh, from the point of view of someone who's writing a new consumer of libzfs to interface with their appliance or, or other stack. Um, and the change list code, uh, it, which is used to mount and share and unmount and unshare things, is uh, well, it needs some work. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that. Yes. Um, yeah, this, this, what you just said, code, that could be, code that's intended to be shared between, between ZFS and ZPool, but not intended for any other consumer. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to imagine what, what kind of a type of code that would be. So um, the example that I gave here is this um, zprop get list is for, it's for parsing comma separated properties. So if you have a string that's like used comma quota, then um, <coughs> for example, when you're doing ZFS uh, list that, you know, ZFS, uh, what is it, ZFS get uh, used. Is this uh, really fun, functions that aren't really intrinsic to ZFS? Right, it's, it's not really intrinsic to ZFS, it's just kind of 
used for parsing. There's, there's a bunch of things like this um, for parsing stuff. Um, for uh, and we'll get some more examples later that I, I think will be interesting. A lot of it is things that are kind of very user interface oriented um, and really belong in the user interface, which in this case is the CLI, you know, or maybe you know your web GUI that you're writing for it, or whatever. Um, but uh, don't belong in a supported, uh, clean, tight interface to administering ZFS um, programmatically. Um, th you know, this is stuff that could probably just move to you know maybe some other library or you know some some little some .c file that gets compiled into both ZFS and ZPool, right? Little kind of helper functions like that. <coughs> so um, I had this idea of. Uh, trying to improve some of these things. Um, it, and for now I'm calling this libzfs2. So I thought about what are some of the goals that we want for this kind of library. Uh, so first of all, obviously it should be thread safe. Um, and uh, I think it's preferable to accomplish this by uh, avoiding global data. So avoiding situations where we're caching uh, rather than by, um, at, for example, you know, we could achieve thread safety by adding lots of mutexes everywhere and um, you know, like what we do in the kernel, where things actually need to be accessed concurrently um, and because there is inherently shared data. But uh, a lot of the shared data that's in libzfs1 is kind of uh, false uh, false global data, right? It's, it's things which are global variables, but they're only relevant to the calling thread. Uh, they're not actually modified concurrently by multiple threads. Um, second, of course, we want a committed interface. We want consumers to be able uh, to work on future releases. So you'll wait, so you would be able to install um, updated binaries, uh, updated Lumos binaries with libzfs, and have uh, your product that's built on top of that uh, continue to work um, regardless of any you know enhancements that we've made to libzfs. Um, so this means that the interfaces would not be changed. Um, we want to have programmatic error handling. So rather than printing stuff to standard output, um, have routines def uh, return defined error numbers, uh, or um, in some cases, uh, in some cases, the reason that things are printed to standard output is because um, an operation has many parts to it. So, for example, um, when you're taking a uh, snapshot, you could just be taking one snapshot, or you could be doing a ZFS snapshot dash R, which creates many snapshots. Um, so th there could actually be uh, different errors for for different snapshots, or you might just want to be able to say, hey, look. I couldn't create all of the, I didn't do anything, but, and here's the list of all the snapshots that were causing the problem, as opposed to uh, just here's the one, one of those snapshots, or just, there's a problem with one of these, I can't even tell you which one it is. Um, so uh, we want to have uh, clear atomicity, so we want, to be, we want it to be clear um, when you make a call into libzfs, uh, is this a call that's going to totally succeed or fail, or is it multi-part? Um, this, this will make it easier for uh, consumers to know what sorts of errors they're going to have to deal with. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, in libzfs1, when you do like a zfs send or a zfs receive, uh, some types of zfs send are, um, well, some types, actually all of zfs send and all of zfs receive are not Atomic in that um, you could. Well, maybe that's not totally true. <laughs> I, I was thinking this through as we go, but um, you with ZFS received, you definitely end up with like it, some of the file systems received and others of them not received. Versus if you're receiving just one file system, then you would know that it, it could either be all received or um, all not received. Um, so we wanted to make that clear. So one of the ways. To do that would be to, is to make the ZFS2 uh, a thin layer. So generally, just marshaling arguments from the consumer down to the kernel, um, and having like a one to one, uh, one to one to one uh, uh, mapping from um, libzfs2 functions to ioctals and the, all those being uh, atomic operations. Any questions about these goals so far? <coughs> <coughs> 